Hi, my name is Nuno Bacharel and I'm the Communications Manager at BSEM, the International Brahmin Council. Today, we are here with Professor Richard Oroks for a new Meet the Experts interview. Professor Oroks has a degree in chemistry from the Oxford University and has dedicated the last 40 years into the research of all aspects of flame retardant fibers. Let's talk with Professor Oroks. Let's talk Roman. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Oryx. Um, I understand that you have been uh, undertaking uh, research into flame retardant textiles for many years. Could you please outline how uh, you became interested uh, in this area? Yes, well, as you say, I've studied chemistry at the University of Oxford. And during that period, I became interested in what chemists call fast reactions, anything which is very, very fast and requires very sophisticated instrumentation. I then went on to my PhD, where I looked at fast photochemical reactions, and I did a postdoctoral fellowship in Canada looking at fast radiochemical reactions. So speed was the essence, you might say. After a few years in industry, I decided I'd go into academic life. So I went to the University of Bolton, into the then Department of Textiles, to introduce synthetic fibres into the curriculum. And during that time, I set about setting up research interests. Well, flammability is a fast process, and it was the flammability of textiles which attracted me to that area. And so here we are, 40 years later, I'm still looking into the flammability of materials and the whole of fire safety is the speed at which fires, fires will be generated and the speed at which people can evacuate buildings. You have mentioned the importance of uh, the flammability of materials. Uh, what are uh, a few of the unique challenges to make textiles uh, fire resistant? Well, very early on, <clears throat> when I was starting research at Bolton in the 1970s and 80s, Two particular fires um, really illustrate the complexities of textiles in fires. The first was the Woolworths fire in Manchester in 1979, which was associated with a, a, a stack of furnishing fabrics and furniture, uh, and that illustrated the problem of furnishing fabrics in contact with polyurethane foam. And five years later, at Manchester Airport, there was a fire in an aircraft on the on the runway in which 50 people died. It was a it was a fuel fire, and the the speed of fire was uh, such that uh, people could not escape the static aeroplane in time. And the major cause of death and 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 the fire hazard was the seatings in that aircraft, and that brought forward the now international regulations on fire safety in seatings in aircraft. Both those um, uh, situations illustrated the hazard of furnishing fabrics, in both in terms of the speed at which they ignite and the toxic fumes which are, are admitted, especially when polyurethane foam are the fillings in each of those seating components. Well, textiles alone are very complex materials in a way, because each fiber, whether it's cotton, wool, polyester, polyamide, polyacrylic, burn in a different way. And when we blend them together, they even become more hazardous because we can never predict how a given blend will behave until we test it. And it's into this area that brominated flame retardants applied as back coatings to these furnishing fabrics have been particularly useful over the last 30 years or so. As you point out, Professor Oryx, uh, flame retardants have a long history of use for treating uh, textiles, particularly for applications like furniture. What are the unique characteristics of brominated flame retardants that make them work so well in applications uh, like this? Well, as I said, blends in particular are very difficult to predict in terms of flammability. And whilst each of the component fibres may burn in a different way, the actual flame chemistries of all these fibers are very, very similar. And it is here that the brominated flame retardants act in that they quench the flame. So they will quench the flame from a cotton fabric, from a polyester fabric, from a woolen fabric, or indeed a blend in exactly the same way. And this means 
that you can actually apply a brominated flame retardant to any textile and it will behave as an efficient flame retardant. Well, during the last 25 to 30 years, there have been many attempts to produce alternatives, um, non-brominated, non-halogenated flame retardants. And many of these are based on phosphorus and nitrogen systems. Well, these systems don't act in the flame. They act on the, the so-called degradation processes. When you heat a fiber, it decomposes and produces volatiles. These volatiles are flammable, and these are the fuels for the fire. But each fiber has a unique thermal degradation mechanism. And so a flame retardant based on phosphorus and nitrogen has to be tailored exactly to suit the particular thermal degradation patterns of each fiber. And that means if you have a furnishing fabric of cotton or polyester or polyacrylic, it needs very different flame retardant systems to be designed to suit it, even though they're all based on phosphorus and nitrogen. And this then explains why, to a certain degree, no effective replacement for the brominated flame retardants in, fabric, in the furnishing fabrics have really been found over the last 20 years or so. On your most recent paper, uh, you have talked about the potential for bio-based organobromine compounds. Uh, could you tell us more about this substance and why they can be a sustainable solution to flame retardancy? One of the problems with flame retardants generally is that they, are, they require a high level of application to be effective both in textiles and indeed polymers in general. And so there is concern about the high levels of the flame retardants which are going to be in use across the, uh, the world in various domestic and public situations. Which then leads us to, to the question, well, can we make flame retardants more sustainable, more environmentally acceptable? Now, bromin, brominated flame retardants have, had, have been accused for many years of being particularly um, environmentally unsustainable. And this, to a certain degree, is unfair because the finger has been pointed at bromine so that all brominated organo materials are potentially toxic. And yet, as Dr. Gribble in one of your earlier interviews stated, bromine is an, an element essential for life. And this is illustrated by the fact that over 2,000 naturally occurring brominated species exist both in terrestrial and oceanic environments. And these are produced by living organisms to, uh, to help them with, with their life. And because these brominated systems don't increase in concentration over time, one can only assume there are biodegradation mechanisms also in nature, which enable these, these materials to, be, uh, to revert to non-toxic, more simple compounds. I think one of the main questions we have to ask ourselves is, do we understand the natural biodegrading chemistries of the naturally occurring organobromine species which occur in nature? And the answer is, we don't. They happen, they are very efficient, and so really we should uh, undertake research to understand why they are efficient, and therefore, uh, we can, can we synthesize molecules which mimic the, uh, their natural analogues and also enter into that same biodegradation cycle. There are quite a number of research papers which show that if you take a typical di brominated diphenyl ether and you put a hydroxyl group on it, it becomes biodegradable. And so the answer really lies, we must learn more about what is happening in the natural environment and then look closely at the chemicals we're already making and ask, well, how can we simply modify them so they can enter into that natural, what I call a bromine cycle. Switching to more immediate development, we note that the United Kingdom uh, furniture regulations are currently under review and that chemical flame retardants are in the spotlight. Given their long and successful history in preventing deaths and injuries, what perspectives would you offer in terms of balancing uh, fire risks with chemical risk? Well, the, the revision of the 1989-1990 uh, the the regulations have been underway for some time, and there are two major features, one of which is eminently sensible, in that 
over the last 30 years since the UK regulations were put into place, manufacturing techniques for furniture have significantly changed. And so the way we mount the sample, the fabric and the, the underlying filler or foam have got to be modified to reflect more modern uh, manufacturing processes. So that is one side of the proposed revision. And the other side, however, is, uh, to my mind, uh, a little bit more um, what you might call controversial, because driven by the environmental pressures of the last 10 years, there was a desire to change the regulations without changing fire safety in a, in a manner which would reduce the flame retardants being used within a typical suite of furniture. Now, if we just go back to the current regulations, there are two main ways we test a particular furnishing fabric. We, we take a sample furnishing fabric over a combustion modified foam, which reflects a foam used commercially and has to have its own flame resistant characteristics. And we test that to a cigarette burn test. In other words, will it ignite or smolder when subjected to a cigarette? And the second test is to then test the barrier properties of the furnishing fabric itself over unmodified polyurethane foam. And that is tested or exposed to a simulated match, a small butane flame. Now the argument in the current revi revision is that if the second part of the test is modified so that we, we test the actual furnishing fabric over combustion modified foam, we may be able to reduce the amount of flame retardant required in the fabric so that the whole composite passes the test. But this ignores um, some of the definitions of what a standard combustion modified foam is. And unless you actually define all foams in commercial use should be the same as our standard combustion modified foam which is in the testing environment, you're not going to get consistency of results. So the current regulations are suggesting that you will put two different flame retardant chemistries, that of the foam and that of the fabric together, and always produce the same consistent results. So what will the manufacturers do, do you think? Well, I've talked to one or two manufacturers, and they've spent 30 years developing a whole range of back coatings to suit different customer requirements and suddenly they're now asked to to, to uh, test their fabrics over a combustion modified foam. Well it's easy perhaps to reduce some of the flame retardants they put onto the backing of their cloth and test over the foam and get a result but then they are faced with consumer legislation. And if a, a suite of furniture happens to be at the center of a, of a tragic fire where there is litigation following loss of life and the finger is pointed at the manufacturer who has reduced the amount of flame retardant that he f has put into his fabric prior to the imposition of the new regulations, in a court of law, he will still be liable under consumer law. His fabric may have tested past the test, but he as a manufacturer will be liable. And so most of the, the UK manufacturers will not probably reduce the amount of flame retardant. They will stay with their well-proven uh, selection of finishes and treatments, which they know work over unmodified foam. And so really the second part of the regulation should be severely questioned. I have questioned it, but those questions have been largely ignored. Professor Orox, once again, thank you so much for uh, this discussion and for sharing your ex insights and expertise on flame retardants and the potential of bio-based organobromine uh, compounds. I would like to congratulate you once again for these uh, 40 years of career uh, and amazing achievements. Um, and for those that have watched one more of uh, the Meet the Experts interview, I would like to um, invite you to subscribe to the Let's Talk Bromley newsletter and to follow us, of course, on our social media channels on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you so much.